Hello and welcome to the Car Kirana channel and welcome to Mr. 2. Now, the MR2, the Toyota MR2, has always been a very, very interesting car. Initially, when it came out in the 80s, it was very cool, very kind of a radical concept. Then the MR2 in the 90s, which was even more exciting and great. And then come the MR2 Spider, very short life wasn't really a big seller, but it's such an interesting car. It's actually a beautiful one, in my opinion. This one is a 2003 manual transmission, not SMG. We're going to talk about our SMT. We're going to talk about the transmissions in a little bit, but let's explore this car, starting with lifting it up. It's already on the lift. We're going to look at the inside and outside and everything when we pull it up a little bit, but let's lift it up so you can see some of the just interesting these things that they had to do when they decided to put the engine in the back. Let's take a look underneath the MR2. And the thing with mid-engine cars, and most people assume that MR2 stands for mid-engine rear-wheel drive, that is not the case. And we're gonna have, you're gonna see why it's called MR2 in a bit. But the first thing with mid-engine cars is, how do you figure out the setup? There are multiple ways to figure it out. One of them is, where are you gonna put your radiators? Some of them put them in the back, some of them in the front, and then your power steering situation, if you have hydraulic power steering. There's a few issues with mid-engine cars. But this one is classic Toyota. They just found ways to keep things extremely simple. So this MR2 actually have radiators just in the front. Just a big old radiator and condenser, nothing really to it. But then because the engine is all the way in the back, we have enormous lines. Now this is not a very long car, so the lines are not as enormous, but still. You have two coolant pipes and then two AC lines that basically run the length of the car. And if you look here, you have actually two drains on the coolant lines. That's just Toyota's way of doing things. And you, AC lines have to go to the back, coolant lines have to go in the back, and all this semi-massive complication. And of course, heater core lines also come back this way. It's just you could say there is a lot going on, but it's actually not. However, what you do not have going all the way to the back is the power steering lines, because this actually does not have a power steering pump or at least an engine driven power steering pump. This has the world's most complicated power steering pump. It's actually not really that complicated. Toyota had done this one well, they don't really have issues. It's an electro hydraulic power steering pump. It's just a instead of having a mechanical pump that pressurizes the fluid, you basically have a hydraulic electric power steering pump. So you don't have lines going to the back, there's no power steering in the back, and uh, we'll look underneath when we get it down and out of the rack so we can open the doors, open everything. But let's move back here, and kind of to the reason why this car is in the shop today. So all the covers are off because this car needed two things. One of them was a drive belt, we replaced it, original drive belt it was not in good shape folks and then the other thing we have a small oil leak from the chain tensioner something that is common with this engine and by the way if you're looking at this engine and it's like hmm this looks familiar it is because this is a Corolla engine no thrills nothing it's just a Corolla engine beautiful engine works really good it's just your orientation with a car like this will have to you you're kind of used to looking at this engine from this direction, you know, your intake manifold is in the front, your compressor is right here, your oil filter is here, and this is usually the back of the car and the rest. Here, when we're gonna look under, under the hood, which is actually the back, you're gonna look at things from the other angle, from the exhaust side. Exhaust is super simple on these. There's not really a span of exhaust. So I guess instead of having a giant exhaust that runs the length of the car, you have coolant pipes and AC lines, but the exhaust is very simple, comes out right here, loops around, goes up to the massive muffler, and then comes back out. Because you still have to have the span of the exhaust. And you see the big muffler right here. It actually wraps up and then comes back down to here. 
pretty cool design. Now, this particular MR2, and we kind of intentionally skipped over that, this is a complete survivor. I mean, it is an incredible shape. It has very low miles. I mean, there is zero rust anywhere, literal zero rust. I mean, look, control arms, all clean. Eccentrics, these are usually the first thing that get coated with rust. We have color on the bolts. All the bolts, everything you look around here is an immaculate shape. And of course, being the perfect MR2, this has a regular manual transmission, not the world's most complicated manual transmission, which is the sequential manual transmission. Toyota, they kind of were running out of ideas for this, I feel like. And they wanted to make something strange. And it was horrendously strange. So this MR2, or certain years in this generation MR2 Spider, came out with a sequential manual transmission. SMT, not SMG. Basically a manual transmission, instead of you shifting, it has a hydraulic clutch that the computer disengages, engages, and shifts gears. And basically it's an automatic transmission that you shift manually but it is actually an automatic manual transmission that is shifted automatically. Very, very complicated, very unnecessary, and horrendously unreliable, and very undrivable, basically. It's horrible. If you ever buy one of these, forget about that. Just get a manual transmission. Your life will be much happier in the MR2. And if you come closer here, and this is what the car was, was in the shop for, we haven't cleaned it yet intentionally, you'll have oil dripping all over here on the backside. Very common for these to develop basically three kinds of leaks. And this one have one and a half, if you would. So we have either a timing chain tensioner that's leaking, front timing cover, or a head gasket leaking oil externally. Very common with these. We're gonna start with the simplest one. I don't think the front cover is leaking so by looking at it. It's most likely a timing chain tensioner. However, I have a feeling that we might have an external head gasket leak, but we're gonna clean it up he barely drives this car, so we're gonna wait a year and then see where the leak shows up again. Let's just look at the condition it's in. I mean, this is prime candidate for rust. There is absolutely no covers, nothing. You just got exposed body. But folks, this thing have zero rust. It's super clean underneath. This is such a well-preserved car. And this is an Illinois car. I mean, uh, this is, pure preservation, this looks beautiful. And uh, mechanically, I mean, this, this is an older car here. It doesn't have miles, we're gonna look at the miles in a bit, but it's still an older car. I mean, you look at the suspension, of course, zero rust, no leaks, no issues, everything looks great. Same thing in the back, we go all the way in the back, nothing. Just a little bit of surface rust on the struts here but otherwise it really has nothing it's really in good shape this thing let's lower it down let's get it off the lift and uh we'll check it out because there's a lot of quirks in this one So the first thing we're gonna look at here, this is a spider. So of course, the roof comes off. So let's, uh, let's take the roof off. This is pretty cool. This thing is really cool. But before we do anything, let's look under the hood. Let's push this thing. Let's look at the situation that we got here. So engine's in the back, front is a frunk, not really a, so you use the handle to open the trunk in your normal car to open the hood. And the hood doesn't have a safety because it's not in the front. 
And here is the engine. Now when you look at it, Corolla owners, think of it as you're looking at it upside down. And this will start to make sense. If you remember the Corolla, the intake manifold is all the way up there. Exhaust manifold is usually in the back in your Corolla. This is the other way around. This engine is a 1ZZ FE. I told you, it's a Corolla engine. Very good engine. Take care of it, it'll take care of you. Business as usual. Bleeding coolant in this car is a very interesting proposition because you have to bleed the entire pipe. Can get really tricky. They are really difficult to bleed actually, but that's the one downside of having the engine all the way the wrong side. If you look here, you got a cover here to the, with one of those warning signs because this is where the big muffler that we looked at at the bottom is. So you don't want to put your hand here as you're working on this car because this gets really, really hot. Very simple to work on it, except if you're doing anything in the front or kind of where the intake manifold is because it's all the way down there. There's really no way to get to it. You have to crawl in the sides and all that. But in order to help with kind of general airflow, because you have the exhaust here, you have the engine. I mean, even though the radiator is in the front, you still need some airflow. They put these vents on the side. No, this is not a fake vent right here. This vent, you can actually, if you look at the vent from this angle, you can actually see hoses and stuff because this vent actually goes right inside the car and we can look in the engine bay where it goes. If you look right there in the corner, that's where that vent comes through. Pretty interesting there. So it's an actual vent, of course, it has to be there for, for this cooling effect to happen. Now, this also has another vent from the other side, really hard to see it, but it's basically the same thing. Kind of creates airflow as we go. Very cool. But this is not even the beginning of cool. Of course, this is an actual vent that kind of pushes air through here and circulates air down and out here just to kind of push that heat out. In mid-engine cars, you want to push the heat out of here as fast as possible because it could really build up. Because remember, in a, when the engine's in the front, you have the air kind of pushing through the radiator into the engine bay and underneath. Here, you don't have much of that going on. But the interesting thing about the MR2 is the front. Most people will assume, and I've seen this many times. People will walk up to this car and we're like, well, it's a Toyota. If the trunk release opens the hood where the engine is, we're going to have something over here to open the front. However, you have nothing. There's nothing. How do you open the front? Here's where quirk number one comes in. You walk over to the glove box. which is an old school Toyota glove box that you squeeze two buttons. And here is the frunk release. Very interesting place for it. Don't know why it's here, but that's what Toyota decided. Now you come to the frunk is where we find out why this is called the MR2. And you notice this did have a safety release because this could get picked up by the wind and thrown in the windshield, so you have to have the secondary safety. The rear one doesn't really get picked up by the wind. And here's why it's called MR2. The Japanese could not be more clear as why they called it the MR2. Midship runabout, that's what MR stands for. And the two is a two-seater. Very interesting naming system here, but that's what they went with. Now, underneath this, you have a lot going on here. You have your fuse block here, washer fluid, brake fluid, your power steering, that complicated power steering is actually here. You have a radiator here. However, you do have a small little storage area with a little strap that you can hook up. And now it stays, once I'm able to figure it out. There we go. Your spare tire is here. 
This is a testimony to how things change in the automotive business. I mean, this is the tiniest of cars. This is such a small car that storage is at a premium. And the only real storage you have, it has a spare tire. Today you have ginormous SUVs with no spare tire. It's just how things have changed because uh, I don't fault manufacturers for not having spare tires anymore because majority of people driving these days, they don't even know how to change a spare. If you have a flat, they don't know how to jack up the car, do all this, so what's the point? However, for those of us that still do, I always love to see a spare tire and this has a spare tire. Very small spare tire, but hey, it's a spare tire nonetheless. Let's close the front and then we'll look at the interior of this car where there are a few interesting things here because space is a premium in this car. So the first thing is the front is basically unusable because you have the spare tire. More important stuff. But if you lean the seat back, they actually put a lockable storage. And I have to say, it's pretty enormous. I'll open the other one and you can see it. You know, usually mid-engine cars will have some kind of storage here, but this thing really takes it to the next level. That's pretty big storage, folks. Kind of feel jealous, wish normal cars would have this. And of course, over here you have your little uh, wind deflector, in case you need it, and the roof is down. The spare tire tools are here, the jack, whatnot. Very interesting. So this car has only 52,470 miles. Very old school interior. You have one more storage uh, place here, because the glove box is not even that big. Old school Toyota radio, I love it. But one thing that is interesting, it's like you have this space between the center console and where all your controls are. Nothing really, cup hold, small cup holder. I mean, if you look at the engineering here, this is not a tiny interior. It doesn't feel like you're sitting like this. It's actually pretty comfortable. And I'm not a small guy, I'm a bigger guy. So sitting here, yes, getting in and out of it is tough. A lot of engineering went into this, folks, and it shows. Simplistic interior, nothing really much to it, but this is a super fun car to drive. It's, it's actually super reliable because of the engine, mirror, the windows are right here. They're not on the doors. And just things are very, very simple. The door locks, which is another one that is interesting, they're actually right here. They kind of, this is the stuff that they kind of, you can tell these were afterthoughts because uh, this switch location is kind of random. And something that is common with these, and you're gonna laugh at this, because of the interesting placement of position of the switches, I mean, you have the door locks here, fog lights, whatnot, the window cancel switch. Now, why do we need a window cancel switch in a car like this? Only Toyota from, 2000, from early 2000s can tell you. But something that's common that I've seen actually a lot, and don't laugh at this, this is actual real world problems. People come in saying passenger window doesn't work anymore. And all they did was they pressed this with their knee when they walked in the car. I've seen this so many times that, yeah, I figured this is the thing. So if your passenger window doesn't work and your MR2 Spider, make sure this is off. Kind of self-explanatory, but I've seen it enough where I'll bring it up. What a beautiful car. I mean, the car itself and then this particular one, it is so well preserved and it has really only one singular issue that the owner pointed out the second he got out of it when he brought it to the shop. Because this MR2 is so low to the ground, if you drive through construction, every single rock will hit the windshield because they'll just come right on top of the hood and hit the windshield. And that's exactly what happened. If you look here, there's a chip. Chip started right here, cracked the original windshield. This is not cool. This is where we have problems. I hope we can still get a windshield for this. I don't do windshields in my shop, so we have to sublet it out, but I hope we can get an original windshield because otherwise this is completely original. There's nothing aftermarket here. Nothing has been kind of put together wrong and all that. It's actually in great shape. 
Could use a clean, but again, this is not a car driven often, so it sits, doesn't get dust on it. And then what I love about this is, see, we, we on the second channel, we looked at a Mazda Miata. In my book, this is kind of the same niche of cars, even though this is mid-engine. The Mazda had a very complicated roof, there is automatic and all that, although that was the RF edition. But over here, I actually like the simplicity of the roof. You just pull this, put it up, put two latches inside, we're done. That's it, the roof is up. There's no need for extra complication. And this is the cool thing about these. Now with the roof up, even though it's not official official, you do have more storage here. You can see it right there through, through the glass which is an actual glass, this is Toyota style for you, with a defogger. Usually convertible cars will have some kind of plexi thing that gets yellow from the sun. This is actual glass with a defogger on it, but you have some storage here. I wish, kind of secretly, I wish the MR2 would come back because it was one of those cars that it just had a, a special soul to it. I really like MR2s. They're reliable. They're fun. It's relatively easy to work on-ish. Depends what you're doing. They're just awesome. And in Toyota, they're trying so hard to make a TRD Camry and do all that. This are the kind of cars, even though they don't sell, but these are the kind of cars that kind of make the brand fun. Yet we don't have them anymore. However, let's hold that story for a second. There's been a lot of talk about the MR2 coming back. And you know what? If you've never been in, in an MR2, you've never driven one, you need to. If you get a chance, drive one of these. They are fun, they're beautiful, nothing dangerous where you're gonna get tickets or whatever. You could take it on a track. They're a little rear heavy, so they tend to be a little interesting when you take corners, but they're really fun cars to drive. And you can actually daily drive them unless you have snow and then it becomes a problem because this is a real, real drive. What a beautiful car that is preserved. I really like this. And before we wrap up the video, let's give you a quick update on a few things that are, we've, you've seen a lot in videos and some you haven't. The Alabama LS430, still here, completely done. 100% done, we're just waiting for pickup. The owner is contemplating sending it for detailing here or back home, that is, we're waiting for his decision. This is a newborn child. And that is a cue to another video that we've done. This is another oil burner. Thanks very much, 10,000 mile oil change intervals. But this one is actually done. We're not 100% done. We still gotta clean a few things and everything. But uh, if you take a peek right here, we have a brand new short block. See the shiny, beautiful short block. We actually just finished this yesterday. We haven't had a chance to do much with it today other than just second oil change to clean everything out. But we still gotta clean it, drive it a little bit. Should be done. Let me show you the short block out of this one. We can squeeze between the cars. Here is the old short block. And no, this is not out of the 15 Camry. This is actually a one ARFE. This is a 2.7. By the way, it is exactly the same as the uh, two ARFE, but uh, same thing, same deal. Scratch cylinder walls. We actually bore scoped this one before we even took it apart to get to know give the customer an accurate idea of what's going on. So uh, they know before we dig into it, then find out. I just don't like doing this stuff because you wanna give your customer an idea before surgery, not during or after when it's too late. So this one needs a short block. The car is actually, it's not from Illinois. So it doesn't have, it, it hardly has any rust actually. It's from, the, from Indiana, I believe. and. They don't use as much salt as we do here in Illinois, so the car is not even rusty. It does have 194,000 miles or so. Did the short block, did actually VVTi gears as well. They were rattling. Turned out great. But I noticed one thing with this car that was a little scary. So when I took it apart, there was actually a guide that was broken. 
completely just gone and we found the rest of it in the oil pickup. So these are the two guides on that engine. This is the movable one where the tensioner pushes and this is the fixed one. Nothing wrong with these. But then there's a guide between the chain. This one. There's supposed to be a piece of plastic here. Well, it's long gone. And if you look here, the chain's been kind of grinding into it. This is what happens when you have bad BBTI gears. This is the first victim. And then th I've seen these snap in half. It literally just breaks in half. Because as the chain is going and the VBTI gears are rattling and they can't hold, they're just putting such a vibration on the chain, it could actually break these. And on this one, we ended up replacing both gears. The intake is usually the one that makes the noise, but we replaced the exhaust as a precaution. We went this far, the engine is all torn apart. Might as well replace both. Folks, remember, even though we kind of strayed away from the MR2, 10,000 mile oil changes, not a great idea. 5,000 miles, six months, you're safe. We're not going to enter the, car, the debate on that again, but from experience, 5,000 miles, six months. I hope this video is helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have yourself a wonderful day.